Hi folks, I'm Steven Alexander of Chucklefish, Senior Level Designer on Wargroove. We've just launched our brand new free expansion, Wargroove Double Trouble, which adds a bunch of new tools to the map editor. So we wanted to give prospective creators a crash course in how you can get started producing and sharing your very own content. Whether you're making competitive multiplayer maps, single player missions, story driven campaigns, or perhaps even a custom game mode. In this first video, we're going to be learning how to use the most basic functions of the editor. I'm going to show you how to set up your map, set up your players, and then we'll go over how to start actually putting things down. I'll be including timestamps in the description below that you can use to jump to the sections of the video that you're most interested in. With introductions out of the way, let's dive in. To get started, head into Custom Content, select Create, and then select Map. In this area, you'll see the list of any maps you currently have available to edit. If you've yet to try making any maps, then yours will probably be empty. Let's create one now using the new map button down below. So here we are with our mostly blank canvas. Before we do anything else, it's a good idea to set up some basic map properties and decide how many players we want duking it out. You can bring up the map editor menu either by clicking the wrench icon up top or by pressing escape. Let's go ahead and jump into map properties. We've got a whole bunch of settings here, all related to your new map and how you want it to operate. Let's go over them real quick. Name is pretty self-explanatory. This is the title that your map will show up with on map selection screens, campaign maps, and online. Description is where you can tell people more about your map. It's layout, the style of play, or perhaps even a backstory you had in mind for it. The third setting, map type, is probably the most important. This determines what kind of things you can do with your maps and how they are played. You have three options. Skirmish is for making multiplayer maps that use the standard Wargroove rule set. Scenario is the most flexible map type, ideal for making story driven missions and custom game types. It grants you access to the event and cutscene editors, which can be used to do all manner of incredible things once you understand how they work. The last map type, Puzzle, is for crafting battle scenarios that the player has to complete in a single turn. For the purposes of this video, we're going to keep things simple and make our map a skirmish type, so let's go ahead and pick that now. Our next map option is Biome. Biome is a mostly aesthetic choice that switches the tile sets and decorations without modifying gameplay. The only exception to this rule is the Volcano Biome, which we added in the Double Trouble expansion. The Volcano Biome restricts access to naval units and makes river tiles impassable to ground units, so keep that in mind if you're considering filling your map with lava. For my map, I'm going to stick with grass. Visibility and weather let you decide what the default rules of your map are going to be. If you want people to play your map with Fog of War turned on, then you can use visibility to do that. If you prefer how your map plays without windy and severe weather, you can set it to always sunny. Be aware that because this is a skirmish map, players will have the option of switching these rules to suit their own preferences. The music option lets you set what track will play on your map. By default, it will play the theme of the current player's commander, but if you want a specific mood, you can pick a single track instead. The last map property we'll want to set is size, which is in its own tab on the top. Upon switching over, you can see a preview of our map on the left and a bunch of values representing each side. Whenever you open this tab, the two bottom numbers will always reflect the width and height of your map. As you can see, my map is currently 24 tiles wide and 13 tiles high. This is a good moderate size for a map, but I think I'd like to make mine a bit smaller. You can resize your map by shifting these values left and right. Notice that as the numbers change, the red lines in the preview are shifting around to reflect the new size and shows you what parts of the map are getting cut out or extended. In the case of my map, I'd like it to be 20 by 13, so I'm going to shift a couple of spaces off each side. One thing to be mindful of when resizing your map is that anything outside the red box will be completely removed. This includes any terrain, structures, units, and decorations you may have already placed. If in doubt, check your map preview before closing the map properties, as the size adjustment will take place the moment you do so. Let's go ahead and close it now. 
Great, that's our map properties set. Now we need to decide how many players we want. We can do that in player properties. So let's open that up now. Here, you can see the current list of players on your map. By default, every skirmish map will start with two players, but can accommodate up to four. Adding new players is as easy as clicking new. For now, let's add two more players. You can also use this menu to rearrange the turn order of these players by simply clicking and dragging them about. If we select one of the players and edit them, a whole new set of properties appear. Right here, we can choose what commander this player has and what color they are. Since we're making a skirmish map, this option isn't all that important to us right now, as whatever commander you pick here will be replaced by the player's choice. This option is more relevant to campaign and puzzle maps, where the player cannot typically choose who they are using. Control lets you decide whether a given player is controlled by a human or an AI. In a scenario or a campaign map, we could use this to set up an AI opponent. The AI profile is what determines how this player will behave if it is controlled by an AI. For the purposes of our skirmish map, I recommend leaving this on balanced, as the other profiles are geared more towards scenario and campaign use. Now the team setting is an important one to pay attention to. Typically, as you add new players, they'll be automatically assigned to their own teams, favoring a free-for-all setup. However, if you're designing a map specifically as a 2v2, 2v1, or even a 3v1, you want to make sure the players you want working together are assigned to the same team. Initial Gold lets you set how much money each player will start the game with. You can bump this up if you want players to be able to get more powerful units off the bat. Since this is a skirmish map, and I'm aiming to keep things pretty competitive, I'm going to leave this on the default 100. Moving on, you've likely noticed there are two additional tabs in this player's properties. The Recruit tab lets you define what units this player is able to recruit. For instance, if you wanted your map to focus more on who uses their infantry better, you could untick all vehicles from this list. When this player accesses their barracks in game, those options simply won't show up. Just remember, this is set per player, so if you want to keep things balanced, you'd ideally make sure all players have the same recruitment restrictions. For my map, I'm going to leave it as standard with all units available. The Commanders tab has a similar purpose. From here, you can restrict the range of commanders available to a player on the character select screen. This can be useful if you think your map is too favorable to a specific commander's groove, or if you're making a scenario where you want each player's selection of characters to be limited. I'm going to keep all of our options open here by leaving them ticked. Now that we've gone over all those player options, looking at it, I'm feeling like this map is perhaps a bit small for four players after all, so I'd like to remove them. We can do that, by going back into edit and selecting delete on the bottom left. The game will warn us that removing a player from the map will erase any units and structures belonging to them. But since we haven't added anything for these two yet, that's not something we need to worry about here. All right, so we've set up our map's properties and have settled on two players. I'm gonna turn on the tile grid in the options menu and then we'll take a look at our battlefield. To start with, you can move the camera around either by scrolling the cursor to the edge of the screen, or by using the WASD keys. At the top of the screen, there is a range of buttons corresponding to various tools. Going from left to right, we have Terrain, Units, Structures, Decorations, and Unit Properties. Let's start with the Terrain tool. Click the button with the mountain on it, or press 1 to proceed. With the Terrain tool selected, on the bottom right you'll see a little window showing your currently selected tile. If you click on it, or press tab, this window will expand to show you the tile palette. Let's start with the forest brush, which you can select either by clicking directly, or by using the WASD keys to navigate to the tile. You can click on the field, or press tab again to close the palette. With your brush selected, you can put a tile down by left clicking once, or hold and drag to paint terrain in broader strokes. Conversely, you can click or hold the right mouse button to clear tiles, which will revert them back to planes. Each tile has rules it follows in how the terrain is drawn. Roads will try to link up to form lines, mountains will try to group together as best they can, and forests pepper the tiles with tree placement at random to create a more organic appearance. If you find yourself unhappy with how a particular cluster of trees looks, just click that tile again with the forest brush selected. 
For the most part, you can place any terrain wherever you want, with a couple of exceptions to be mindful of. The beach tile cannot be placed down without at least one sea tile for it to connect to, and must be placed around the edges of any body of water. In a similar vein, the deep sea tile, denoted by this distinctly darker blue shade, must always be completely surrounded by sea or beach tiles. You want to be careful when placing it. If you put it on or close to land, it will turn all surrounding tiles into sea, potentially erasing a chunk of land along with any units and structures that you may have put on it. Speaking of units and structures, let's go over how you can put those down, since both are placed in a very similar fashion. You can either click the helmet button up top, or press 2 to switch to the unit placement tool. Just like with the terrain tool, we can see a preview of our currently selected unit on the bottom right window. You'll notice the unit is dangling from our cursor as well. If you click the bottom right window, or press tab, it will expand to show our unit palette. Just like the terrain palette, you can either click a unit directly to select it, or use the WASD keys to navigate to the one you want. Since the game needs to know who these units will belong to, there is one extra button that the terrain tool didn't have. This button on the bottom right lets you switch which player you're currently spawning units for. Clicking it, or pressing spacebar, will cycle through all players in your map, including the neutral faction. Clicking anywhere in the field or pressing tab will close the palette and enable you to start placing your chosen unit. Just like with terrain, left clicks will place that unit down and a right click will remove them. Dropping a unit on a space with another unit already present will replace that unit with your current selection. It's worth noting the editor will not let you put a unit or structure on terrain that it normally can't occupy. So you're not going to be able to put a cavalry unit on a mountain or a trebuchet in the forest. If the tile cursor disappears while you're hovering a unit over a space, that means your currently selected unit can't be placed there. As an aside, while the cursor is gone like this, you will not be able to delete any units or structures from the area either. So if you're having trouble deleting something, make sure you're not currently holding a unit that can't occupy that space. Structure placement works exactly the same way as unit placement. You can switch over by clicking the tower button up top or by pressing 3. You'll see here in the palette that I have all the essentials. The stronghold, barracks, villages, and so on. You can left click to place these, and right click to erase. If you want a structure to start off belonging to a specific player, make sure you pop it down in that player's colours. If you want a building to be available for capture, put them down as neutral. A couple of minor things worth noting for those of you who care about details. When placing villages, they will randomly pick from three variants. Just like the forest tiles and the terrain tool, you can keep placing a village down in a spot until you get the variants you want. This is also how you can make sure a neutral gate faces your desired direction. Moving along, let's check out the decoration tool, which can be selected with the flower button up top, or by pressing 4. The decoration tool is for adding visual elements to your map that don't alter gameplay. If we pop open the palette with tab, you can see that this one contains a lot more stuff than the others we've seen. Let's start by picking a patch of flowers. Just like the other tools, we can place with a left click and remove with a right click. One thing you'll likely have noticed is that unlike the other tools we've looked at so far, these decorations do not snap to tiles. This gives you a lot of control in where to put them down. You can even place them in spots that overlap each other. This can be very useful for creating more elaborate decorative elements like ruins and unique rock formations. For example, Let's say I want to start with this stone archway. It's pretty cool by itself, but I want to make it something a little more interesting. So I'm going to pick this patch of overgrown stone pavement, put a couple of these down around the area, grab this rock and put it next to the arch. Then finally, I'm going to take a campfire and put it right here in the middle of the arch. Just like that, I've turned a simple arch into something more unique. If you do put a bunch of decorations close together like this, and decide you want to remove a very specific one, pay close attention to the red box that appears as you move your cursor over them. This makes it a lot easier to delete the one you want, without accidentally destroying the others. There is one key exception among the decorations that will snap to tiles, which are the waterfall decorations. These are purpose made for connecting river tiles to sea tiles, as you can see here. The last of the basic tools we have up top is the Unit Properties Editor. Clicking on the Notepad button, or pressing 5, will switch us to it. With this tool selected, if we click on any unit or structure, 
a number of properties will spring up based on the item we selected. If we use this on one of our soldiers for instance, we have four properties we can change. Initial health lets you set the health of that unit or structure when the game starts. This can be useful for instance if you don't want a player's villagers all starting out at full health, or if you want a gate to be more easily destroyed by the players. The damage taken percentage is one of our newer features. Using this, you can modify how much damage a unit or structure will take whenever they are attacked. So if I set this soldier to take 10% of his normal damage, it would take a lot more hits to bring him down. Conversely, if I set both players commanders to take 200% damage, they'd be taken down twice as fast. It bears mentioning that this does not affect the damage that unit will inflict on others. Generally speaking, I would avoid messing with this setting on a skirmish map, as it will not be immediately obvious to your players who are used to the game's standard rules. As a feature, it is markedly more useful in scenario missions and campaigns. You can expect me to touch upon this feature some more in a later video. The player unit property lets you switch which player this unit belongs to, while faction lets you change a unit's appearance to that of another faction. For instance, I could keep this cherry stone soldier on player 1's side, but could switch its appearance to match that of a Felheim undead soldier. This is another feature that's typically more useful for scenarios. One last thing worth mentioning in regard to the unit properties is that commanders have a unique property called Initial Groove. This is a setting that is mostly intended for campaigns and scenarios, but it has been a point of confusion for a number of people, so I'll try my best to explain it. Initial Groove lets you set the amount of groove that specifically this commander will enter the game with. Let's say in this case, I set player 1's Mercia to have 100% groove. If we start the game, and the player in this slot has picked Mercia, or another fast charging commander, like Nuru, they will start off with full groove as you'd expect. However, if this player instead picked a much slower charging character, like Sedge, they'll start the match with his groove only half charged. It's done this way to keep things as fair as possible. If two players jumped into a match with full groove, the advantage would be firmly in favour of the player with the slower charging but more powerful groove. The compromise we came to as developers was giving that player's commander an equivalent amount of charge instead. It's for this reason I recommend not using this setting in your skirmish maps. It's liable to give some players a big advantage and that runs counter to our goal of making a balanced map. So with that, we've gone over all of the most basic tools for building a Wargroove map. By now, you hopefully have a reasonably good idea of how to pop things down, but if you're feeling a bit lost, you can always use our timestamps in the description below to revisit any sections you're still not sure about. In a pinch, you can always jump on the official Wargroove Discord server and get some advice from our incredibly helpful community in the custom content channel. Join me for the next video, where we'll be applying what we've learned here to turn our map into a proper battlefield. 